Today's Bible reading comes from Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. Although an easy read, it's also a very difficult read as well. So the title is Living as Children of Light. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to the sensuality so that to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in the true righteous and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully in his neighbour. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must not steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, uh, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Thank you, Katie. Good morning again, everyone. As always, I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open there in Ephesians, and I would encourage you, if you haven't brought one, go and grab a Bible. They're up the back, and they're there to be used. And please uh, do keep them with you. We'll be using a couple of different passages this morning as we come to God's Word. And if you were with us last week, a quick reminder, if you were absent last week, a bit of a catch up for you, we started to make our transition in the book of Ephesians. Very early on in the series, I told you that Ephesians was a book of two halves. The first focusing on the gospel roots and the second focusing on the gospel fruits. The first half of the gospel is very theological. It digs into some of the great truths of what God has done in and through Jesus and how that is being outworked in the church. And it's done largely from a contemplative point of view. It makes our minds look to Jesus. But it's fairly light in its application. And now in this Ephesians 4 chapter, we start to shift to those gospel fruits, the outworkings of Christ in our life. The remainder of Ephesians will be somewhat lighter in its theology, but heavier in its application. You'll notice even in the passage Katie just read for us, there are a number of very clear instructions for the Christian life. And my encouragement to you as we go through this passage this morning is to have ears open and hearts prepared to hear just one thing. Now, there are, of course, many different things that Paul lists in this passage of Ephesians. But it's been my prayer that God's spirit would convict each of us this morning of one of those things. Something in our life that needs to be worked on for the sake of the church and for the sake of God's glory. So let me encourage you to be open as we work our way through this passage to have ears and hearts to hear the one thing God would have you change or work on in your life. In the first half of this chapter last week, as Andrew opened God's word for us, we glimpsed Paul's vision for the church. Paul speaks of a united people, a oneness of people who have come to Christ. And he urges we, the church, to live in that unity. 
to realise what Christ has done in bringing us together and to thereby live at peace with one another. And Paul says that this would be accomplished as each person does their own part, as each person serves both God and the church with whatever gifts they have been given by Christ through his Holy Spirit. When each member does its own work as Christ has apportioned them to do, we're told that collectively that will enable us to strive forward in unity, united in our common faith, united in Christ and in the knowledge we share of God, and that that will result in maturity, growing up in Christ until we reach, says Paul, the fullness of of the measure of Christ Jesus. That is Paul's vision for the church and our hope for we the church at Forbes Baptist, that we would be united, growing in our knowledge of God, becoming mature as the people of Christ. And with that goal in mind, Paul now shifts to speak of some practical applications. He says there, So I tell you this, a clear link in today's passage to what has gone before. What we see here today flows out of what has been considered previously. Paul could have said, in light of this striving for unity and maturity, live like this. And what he describes now are not the unique gifts of some, not the particular roles of service given to apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, but rather the expectations of all Christians. And he begins it there in verse 17. I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Paul begins this God-sanctioned instruction, this section of teaching, by insisting that the former way of life must be rejected. Now, you will recall from our study of this book that it is written to a largely Gentile church. Ephesus had some Jews there, yes, who had come to recognize Christ as the Messiah, but it was primarily Gentiles who had come to faith. Yet Paul writes here, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. What we need to see is that there's a difference here between the ethnicity of Gentiles, that is, who they are by birth, and the moral understanding that Paul is pointing to. Paul is not saying that they must change their worldly status as Gentiles, just as we don't change from being Australians when we come to faith, but that rather the worldliness that is portrayed by Gentiles, the general anti-God convictions of those people, are the things that need to be done away with. Essentially, Paul is using the word Gentiles here to describe those who are not the people of God. It is a moral delineation that he makes and not an ethnic one. Paul says, don't live like that anymore because that is not what you are. And then in case you've missed it, he clarifies his working definition of Gentile. He says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as Gentiles do. And here's his clarification. In the futility of their thinking. Paul is speaking here of those who are outside of Christ. Those who are lost in their sin. And he describes it as those who are futile in their thinking. Those whose minds are futile. Futile is not a word that we often use, but it simply means unable to bring about the desired purpose. If we have a conversation with someone and find it to be futile, it is because they're 
resistant to any change, the purpose that we're setting out. If we undertake an activity and are unable to achieve the desired outcome, we can describe our efforts of, as futile. It simply means that it cannot do what it is meant to do. And this is how Paul describes those outside of God. They are futile in their thinking. The corrupted person, the Gentile, as Paul uses the word, is incapable of that which the mind was designed for. The human mind designed and crafted by God, our creator, was designed to have intimate knowledge of God. In the previous verses of Ephesians, Paul has described the mind of the believer as one that is maturing in its faith, one that is growing in its knowledge of God and one that is coming to a fullness of Christ. And he says the unbeliever has a mind that is incapable of doing those things. Paul then summarizes what a society marked out by such unbelief looks like. Such a society he describes as lost in darkness, separated from God, living lives which are ignorant, carrying on with hardened hearts. It is a life given over to sensuality, to personal indulgence, to impurity, to greed. It's a life that seeks pleasure outside of God, that lives in excess of selfishness over service. It's impure, immoral, it transgresses God's law, and essentially it makes an idol of itself. That is the life outside of Christ. That is the godless society in which the Ephesians and in which we find ourselves. Now, I don't think here Paul is giving an exhaustive list. It's not a complete description of everything that could be wrong. Rather, he's simply highlighting sinfulness as a condition of the mind as well as of the hardened heart. It's also worth noting here that when Paul describes the unbeliever, the non-Christian in this way, he is not saying that every non-believer is as corrupt as they could possibly be. He is not saying that everyone is so terrible that they could be no worse. But rather he is saying that in the futility of their fallen state, they are incapable of any true godliness or knowledge of God. This is why we can look around the world, our unbelieving friends and family and colleagues, and say that they are good people by worldly standards. But we cannot describe them as godly people if they do not know Christ. For the condition of the lost is separation from God. Paul has described the Christian life of one of fullness of Christ. The non-Christian is an emptiness of anything to do with God. When people focus their lives on anything but God, they naturally move away from him. That is the idea that Paul is describing here in Ephesians 4. He describes it here in brief, but it's more fully articulated at the beginning of the book of Romans. If you have your Bibles, please do turn to Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read quite a number of verses from here to flesh out what Paul is saying in Ephesians 4. I'm going to read without comment because I think the scripture speaks clearly enough for itself. If you come to Romans 1, and I'll begin reading from verse 21. Paul writes, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, 
they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for this error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Friends, that is Paul's assessment of the Gentile society, of those who live apart from the saving grace of God. It is a society that remains presently dead in their transgressions and sins. And Paul, writing to the church, says, brothers and sisters, we must no longer live like that. Brothers and sisters, that is the society in which you live. It's all too easy to forget that. It's all too easy to think of those outside of Christ as good and loving and kind and gracious, for sometimes they are, by worldly standards, those things. But the reality, the spiritual reality, is that those who are far from God are very far from godliness. And whilst it's hard to hear those words, to think of those we love and care about, in such a manner, it is good to be reminded, not so that we would sit in judgment over them, but rather so that we might see their need for the gospel and hear in Ephesians so that we might be on our guard against the temptations and the misleadings that the futile world will offer us. For we are not to be influenced by such things and we are not to embrace such things. We are those who, according to Romans 12, 2, no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but have been transformed by the renewing of our minds. We have come out of that state of depravity, out of that state of futility, and now have the mind of God. And so back in Ephesians, Paul continues with a series of changes that are to be expected in the life of every believer who is maturing in their faith. And he begins by comparing that old self to the new self. We're back in Ephesians 4, picking up from verse 20. He says, That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Unlike the society in which you live, when you first came to faith in Jesus, when you grasped the truth of the gospel and understood what Christ has done for you, you learned differently, says Paul. Your futile mind was corrected and you enrolled in the school of Jesus, where day by day, week by week and moment by moment, you have the opportunity to learn about him, to fulfill the purpose for which your mind was designed, to know God in knowing Christ. And in the school of Jesus, we will be learning together forever. And we have been taught, says Paul, a different 
way to live. Notice he speaks about the truth that we have come to know and how it is knowing the truth that is Jesus, not simply knowing about him, but knowing him that changes our lives. And he gives three quick illustrations to mark this contrast. Firstly, the renewing of your mind. He says your old way of thinking should be replaced. That futile thinking experienced by the Gentiles has now been replaced by a renewed mind that can know God. He also says that you're a new creation, that you have been taken from the old way and made new like God. In contrast to being separated from him as the Gentiles were, we are now with Christ and with God. Then he uses that imagery of old self being put off and the new self being put on. And here I want to make the comment that the putting off of the old and the putting on of the new is something that is both described as passive and active throughout our scriptures. It is Christ's work at us. We are saved by grace through faith, not from ourselves, said Paul earlier in this letter. It is Christ that puts that old self off and puts the new self on. And yet here Paul says we also need to live like that, putting to death and putting aside the old ways and embracing and putting on the ways of Christ. And the new self, he says, pursues holiness and righteousness. The new self is one that is set apart for God and that seeks to live rightly according to God's truth. In 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 9, Paul makes this same point a little clearer. He says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Brother, sister, when you came to faith in Christ, when you grasped the truth and turned to him as Lord and Saviour, when you repented of your sinfulness, the old self died. You were made new, recreated as a child of God, set apart as holy. That is a spiritual reality that has taken place. And now, Paul says, you need to live like that. Even as the old self would draw us back to sin, we must continually put it aside, put it off and embrace who we truly are as new creations in Christ under God. This is the key to living for Christ, to recognize what we truly are according to God's truth and to embrace that in our lives, to put off the old, and embrace the new, the real, what Christ has done. And then Paul presents us with some ways to do that, specifically for the local church and the interactions we have with one another. I'm in verse 25 of Ephesians 4. He says, Therefore, considering this putting off of old and putting on of new, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Paul says, do away with lies and deceit. Put off the old self of falsehood and put on the new self of truthfulness. Move away from lies and deceit and speak only that which is true. Truthfulness in keeping with unity. And you may recall the words of Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love to one another. 
as members of one body, as those under Christ, those new beings, we are to be people who always seek and speak truth, no longer deceiving one another or ourselves, but coming again and again to the truth as Christ did. He goes on to speak of anger. Anger, which here is pointed out, is not a sin in and of itself, but is, if you like, a gateway or a pathway to sin. There can indeed be a good and righteous anger, but anger is dangerous in that it can all too easily blur the mind and lead us to sin. He reminds us that those who have the renewed mind focused on Christ should not be those who are easily angered and certainly not be those who fall into sin. He says that we are not to give the devil a foothold when he speaks of not being angry. It's a great image, isn't it? Us being raised up, elevated somehow, and Satan prowling around seeking to bring us down. In Christ, you are elevated and safe, but our anger has a way of allowing him to climb ever so closer, ever so slightly closer to us. And so Paul says, don't let the sun go down if and when you are angry. It is not a call to have everything squared away by sunset, but rather a way of describing actions that are quick. When we find ourselves angry with other members of the body, when we are concerned or hurt or grieved, perhaps because some falsehood has been spoken, we are to be those who are swift to address those concerns and hurts as they arise. I doubt any one of us would say that dwelling on something that has grieved us, that lingering over it and letting it fester has ever served us well. And yet all too often we fall into that pattern of sitting silently and continuing in our suffering and in our anger. That is how we give the devil a foothold. <coughs> Paul says, rather, act swiftly, speaking truthfulness in love, seek to be restored as soon as possible. He says we must work hard to dispel our anger. You see the reality of our scriptures here? It knows that we won't live in perfect harmony all the time even as we are encouraged to Christ-honouring unity and maturity. The Holy Spirit has led Paul to give us instructions for how to work when we fail. And it is to be as people who act quickly, peaceably, spe speaking truth in love. We must work hard at this. And in fact, Paul says we must work hard in general. He urges those who were previously thieves to turn away from that lifestyle, to turn toward work. Now, perhaps we are not thieves in our old selves. Perhaps you have never stolen anything in your life. That's great. But Australia around us certainly has an anti-work culture. Our society thrives on the long weekend and extended periods of rest and relaxation. Recreation is one of the biggest industries within our worldly nation. Even as our queen passed away this week, one of the conversations in my house was, will we still get the queen's birthday long weekend? <laughs> we love to rest and appropriate godly rest is good, but we were made to work. God's purpose in Genesis in creating man was that we might work the garden on his behalf. And here Paul reminds us that we are all called to practical work and service. Whatever that might look like for the individual, we are to be using our God-given gifts for God-given purposes. To what end? Well, Paul says here in Ephesians 4, that the purpose of our work is the care of others. And that, friends, is even more countercultural in our day and age. Our society thrives on self 
that each individual is the most important in its own life, that you deserve rest and relaxation, that you are the number one in your own life. Well, here the church is told to be countercultural, to place love and compassion and care above selfishness, that in the unity we have in Christ, we who work and have are to care for those who have not. That is a different standard to that of our world. That is the mark of a renewed mind, a mind that loves Christ. And then Paul continues on into his final section, where he gives us two more key points as those who are putting on the new self. I'm in verse 29. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Here, as I was preparing this message, it struck me that what Paul is giving us is two filters to apply to our lives, two things which will help us sift out the old and corrupted and allow through the new and godly. He gives us one relating to our speech and then one relating to our actions. Concerning our speech, he applies this filter. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The word unwholesome there is the same as the Greek word for rotten. Do not let anything rotten come from your mouths. What is rotten talk? Well, I suspect it's vulgarity crude words, falsehoods, hurtful statements, slander, gossip, those many evil things that God condemns both here and elsewhere in scriptures. Anything that would bring down or undermine the hearer. That's a broad stroke that Paul makes here. How easily do you and I slip into such unwholesome talk. Speaking down in jest is one of the hallmarks of the Australian culture. It surrounds us. But here Paul says, have nothing to do with such talk. Speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now in fairness, sometimes that which will build someone else up can be hard. It can appear hurtful, but truth spoken in love will ultimately build others up. And so Paul applies this filter to our words. Don't let the unwholesome through. Only what is good for building others up. The acronym that I've heard used here before is THINK, T-H-I-N-K. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? necessary, kind. If words spoken to others do not fall into those categories, perhaps it is best to filter them out for God's sake. Paul essentially asks, will your words benefit those who hear them? Will they glorify God? If not, don't speak them. And if they do, speak them in love and truth. The second filter that he applies to our lives, pertains to our actions. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And goes on to list a number of attributes which do just that and their correctives in the following verse. Paul says that if you follow Jesus, if you are someone who has been marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit, God himself inside you, you should live as one who does not disquiet, disturb, upset, and grieve that spirit of God within. Anything 
that goes against God's own nature grieves him. Any sin, any unholiness, any inaction where we are called to act, it all grieves the Holy Spirit. He is our internal guide who by his word convicts us, teaches us and grows us. We need to learn to listen to him so that we will not grieve him in our lives. And then Paul reminds us that we should also be swift to forgive where there is failure to do these things. For we are those who have been forgiven much in Christ. If we have come to Jesus, we are those who know what it means to be forgiven. In his atoning death on the cross, we are forgiven our sins. In his conquering resurrection, we are assured of our future hope, where we will be seen as those who are without blemish. Friends, it is the goodness of this gospel that moves our minds away from futility toward usefulness and godliness. And so we must live as such. Brothers and sisters here today, you must recognise that your primary allegiance is not to our society, not to our community, to our nation, but to Jesus. And you can no longer live for both. So, says Paul, put on the new self and put off the old. Friends, we are those who have come to Christ. Do not let Satan have purchase on your life, especially in moments of frustration and anger where others or we ourselves fail. And be swift to filter words and actions, speaking and doing only what is godly and benefits other believers. Would you pray with me that we might be those new people in Christ? Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, there is so very much in this passage. So much that convicts us. So much that corrects us. But equally there is much to celebrate and much to look forward to as your people. At the beginning of our time, I ask, Lord, that you might convict each one of us of one area where we can do better. One thing where we are grieving your spirit, where we are misspeaking or giving in to the old self. I pray now that you might call to our hearts and minds those things of which you would convict us, that we might seek to work on them and to rectify them as we put off the old and put on the new. We ask that we would do this for the benefit of our brothers and sisters here at FBC, but more than that, that we might live lives that do not grieve your spirit, but rather lives that bring glory to our Lord Jesus. We thank you that we have forgiveness in him and pray that where we fail, we would be swift to forgive one another. We ask it all that Christ might be known and that more futile minds might be renewed and turned to him. We ask it in his name. Amen. In response to God's word, we're going to respond in song. Let me encourage you to stand as the band comes forward. We're going to sing, Come Thou Fount.